LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, a conversation about the rise of generative AI, the mainstreaming of augmented reality, and the future of consciousness. I have been fascinated ever since childhood by the scientific story of our origins. How could 10 billion years of rocks swirling in space have resulted in the perfect planet for the development of the first life forms? And how could 3 billion years of microscopic organisms increasing in complexity eventually result in the human experience of consciousness? This continues to be a question without an answer, but there are hypotheses. Some argue that small improvements in the ability of early organisms to predict the future, the rhythms of night and day, for instance, and the approach of predators, increased their rates of survival. Billions of years later, as early primates became more and more social, those who could better predict the behaviors of others in the tribe had a survival advantage. This required developing a theory of mind, an understanding of other humans' personalities and motivations. And this, in turn, resulted in the ability to build an understanding of ourselves and a constant internal monologue about the people and the world around us, which is our experience of consciousness. For many decades now, we have been working on trying to replicate the evolution of human intelligence on computers. It took about 14 billion years for human-level intelligence to emerge in carbon-based organisms, we're told. We've spent about 70-some years trying to build neural networks on silicon. The early models could do simple things like recognize numbers. Later models developed more sophisticated capabilities like recognizing images of cats, which turns out to be surprisingly difficult. With increased computing power and improved software, neural networks developed the capacity to translate languages on their own in ways that the people who built these systems could not understand. Now, they have developed the capacity to write code, and it seems to analyze and understand in some fashion the psychology and motives of humans. This is an extraordinary moment. We may be in the early stages of witnessing the dawn of a second emergent intelligence, a second awakening, no less mysterious, even though it is of our own making. In parallel, as if this weren't mind-boggling enough, we're in the process of building a new layer of perception for humans, and perhaps for AI, in the form of new augmented reality and virtual reality devices, which appear to be on the threshold of a major advance in the form of Apple's new Vision Pro goggles. How will mixed reality technologies interact with artificial intelligence? Are we building the medium through which we will interface with AI using all of our senses? Should we be excited, afraid, or both? These questions are so important and so fascinating that we decided to gather some of our favorite thinkers to discuss them, not just in audio format, but face-to-face. Two weeks ago, we hosted a conversation at the Betaworks Studios in Lower Manhattan with three of our favorite thinkers, David Chalmers, Stephen Johnson, and John Borthwick. David is a cognitive scientist and philosopher who coined the term hard problem of consciousness, came up with the notion of the extended mind, and wrote a book called Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. Stephen is the author of 13 books, including the next big idea original audiobook, Immortality, A User's Guide. He's now a visiting scholar at Google Labs, where he's helping the tech giant develop new AI tools. John Borthwick, the founder of Betaworks, has been building and investing in the machine learning metaverse space for the last decade. And he's helping to launch a new slate of AI startups as part of Betaworks AI Camp. The four of us spoke for more than 90 minutes. If you'd like to hear the full unedited conversation, you will find it on the next Big Idea app. We will also be making videos of this event and our future events available to 
executive members of the Next Big Idea Club. A really exciting new Next Big Idea Club experience that we're launching soon. If you'd like to join the waiting list, email podcast at nextbigideaclub.com. Hi, I'm DC Marshall. Hi, I'm Mita Malik. We are the co-host of the Brown Table Talk podcast, where we discuss how to help women of color thrive in their workplaces. And we invite allies to join us to help women of color win at work. We have a seat waiting for you. Subscribe to Brown Table Talk wherever you enjoy podcasts. Let's begin by talking about the history of AI, which I don't think is widely understood. It wasn't understood by me before I talked about it on the podcast, researched it. Um, AI has been in development for more than 70 years, depending on how you count. Um, and it, it was really born out of an interest in modeling the human brain, which I find very interesting when you look at the early days of AI. Um, Frank Rosenblatt, one of the key architects of early AI, uh, was a psychologist, then a neurobiologist, then a computer scientist. Um, so what I find fascinating about this is that our early interest was both in understanding the human brain and building more useful computers. Stephen, you've written a lot about the brain in the last 20 years, and you're now building AI products at Google. Um, do you think the parallels between biological information processing and silicon-based neural networks are important to understanding what AI is and what it does? And could you share a little bit about how those systems work? Obviously, there are ways in which neural networks are modeled on existing kind of neural systems in the human brain. But I also think there are ways in which um, the kind of the analogy complicates things unnecessarily for us now. So, David actually had a wonderful line that I quoted in that Times piece, um, which was in something you'd written, and I'm curious if you still feel this way, about GPT-3 in the very early days, which you said that GPT-3 was very interesting because it suggested a potentially mindless route to intelligence, that you could get to intelligence without actually inventing a mind, and a mind that was understanding or conscious or sentient in any ways, but it could still output intelligent-like things. That should be our kind of default setting when we think about these technologies, I think. And, and it's, it's hard for us to understand because, in a sense, what's happening is the language models are doing things that, up until now, required a human brain that was capable of being conscious and understanding and having a sense of self. There was the only thing on the planet that could do these things was a human brain that had understanding and had sentience and had consciousness. And now this other thing, for the first time ever, is outputting information that was previously dependent on, say, understanding. And that leads us naturally to kind of assume, well, it must understand. But I don't necessarily think that's true. So the, the best example of this is you can debate, you know, whether this is the beginning of general intelligence and, and all that, which I'm sure we can discuss. But what is indisputable is that a computer can now take any arbitrary string of text you know, a short story that someone has written that no one has ever seen before or an essay that someone's written that has not been part of the training data. And you can feed it into a language model and they can summarize it and explain it at different levels of complexity. You can say, summarize this document so that a five-year-old might understand it. Summarize it so that a college student might understand it. No software in the world could do that five years ago. Nothing but a human brain could do that five years ago. And now that is just part of the basic functionality of of BARD, and there's this other one, ChatGPT, I guess people are using, but BARD is really the best. No, uh, sorry, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. Um, and that is just, that has become, you know, a default thing that they do very well and do instantly. And until now, you had to understand to be able to summarize and explain. And now there is this new technology that does it in, in a very powerful new way. And I think we have to remind ourselves that it may be getting to that kind of insight through a different route. You've talked about, Stephen, how this very simple goal of predicting the next word in a sentence ended up creating this kind of astonishing emergent intelligence. Max Tegmark, the physicist and computer scientist, had this great line that he was shocked by how quickly 
GPT-4 and Bard, no doubt, have accelerated in the last you know, 12 months. And he likened it to the challenge of, of humans creating flight, that for thousands of years, humans wanted to figure out how to fly. And they thought, oh, we have to replicate the movements of a bird's wing. That turns out to be an insanely complicated thing to replicate. And a lot of people died trying to do it. <laughs> right? And then the Wright brothers figured out, actually, if you just get these two stationary things and put some flaps on them and a propulsion system, you can take this incredibly simple mechanism. And then a decade or two later, World War I, you have this astonishing air power and you, it, there are these extraordinary implications. It turns out to be a much simpler problem than we thought. Tegmark's observation was the same is true of machine learning. We thought we had to replicate all the complexity of the human brain. It turns out, actually, this very simple set of parameters and instructions, when given enough computing power, and it took us you know, 30, 40, 50 years to develop the computing power and large enough data sets, once we had those inputs, this very simple structure could create just astonishing intelligence. And, and that's exciting, but at the same time scary, because, it's act because the actual rudiments of the system, in Tegmart's view, are not that sophisticated. Does that resonate for you? Or? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would just very quickly, I remember when I went in to interview the open AI people in, you know, in the fall of 21, and was kind of, it hadn't been fully clear to me how fundamentally based on next word prediction the system was. And it is somewhat more complicated than that, but like that is the basic unit of measure. You're training it to figure out what the next word should be. It, it has an attention window that, that makes that a more complicated set of assessments. But, but generally, that is the metric. You're just trying to get better at that one thing. It starts off incredibly terrible at predicting the next word, and eventually it starts writing you know, short stories for you. And I remember just sitting there and being like, it can't be just based on that. that that's, it's like the kind of poverty of stimulus thing. Um, you know, it just seems like too little uh, a way to, to steer a model towards something resembling intelligence, but it turns out to work. And, and so we had this slow progress for decades. I think it was in 1958 that Rosenblatt released his first perceptron. Then in, in 2012, we have Jeffrey Hinton and his team win this award to, to create the best system to recognize cats, right? Which turns out to be an incredibly difficult thing to do. They exceeded 75% accuracy, I think, in recognizing cats. Then in 2016, I remember reading in the New York Times Magazine this, I think it was a cover story about Google Translate and how all of a sudden, over the course of just a few months, this, this machine learning uh, capability uh, uh, to translate between languages just rapidly, dramatically exceeded the, the capacity of the previous translation systems. So that was kind of shocking. And then in the last six months, we've had this GPT-4 slash BARD explosion of, uh, of capability. I guess, question, question for the whole panel, were you all surprised by the acceleration of capabilities of, of GPT-4 in the last year? I would actually locate the real watershed maybe around 2018 or 2020 with the development of these uh, large language models. Because until then, all AI had been specialized AI. I did my PhD in an AI lab in the early 1990s. My advisor was Douglas Hofstadter, who wrote books like Gödel Le Chabach. And yeah, around then, you know, there were a lot of good AI programs, but they were all specialized. Maybe they'd play chess or they'd... Uh, do math puzzles, or do letter string analogies, or do some little operation on language. And we even had neural networks of the kind that exist now, but they were all smaller and specialized. 2012 was a big advance, because that was when, um, when neural networks turned out to outperform every other machine learning algorithm at things like, at vision problems, like identifying cats and dogs in an image, and so on. But that was still a specialized task. We had, uh, we had AlphaGo playing Go in 2015. That was yeah. still, still specialized. The new thing with, uh, with language models is suddenly language models were at least a little bit good at everything. They could use language. They could tell a joke. They could play chess. They can do math puzzles. Not perfectly. A lot of glitches, a lot of mistakes, misinformation. But the idea of an AI system which could actually do a little bit of everything was new, and I think maybe there were signs of that in GPT-1 right at the beginning. GPT-2, which was, I think, 2019, people detected signs of this, but then GPT-3, which was released in, in 2020, was suddenly quite impressive 
across, across the board. Not amazing, but that was when I think you started to see that there was a potential path here to general, maybe even human level intelligence. I wouldn't say this was human level intelligence by any means, but suddenly you could, uh, you could see the path. I would say that with GPT-4, three years later, what we're doing is seeing now a whole lot of movement on that path. There was a hypothesis, say the scaling hypothesis, that as we make these systems bigger, they'll get much more capable. And I think that's what we're actually seeing. I mean, chat GPT, which was GPT 3.5, was already in advance. And GPT 4 is just so impressive. I mean, it's still not human level intelligence across the board. But if things continue to scale, GPT 6, GPT 7, who knows? John, you've been investing in the space and studying the space for more than a decade. Have you been surprised by the, the recent acceleration? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that as David and Stephen are describing, I mean, takeoff points it, clearly with the advent of neural networks and then transformers, 2017 transformers. I think that the, with, and then also I think the ability to hold a large context window and have memory. Um, because those earlier models and with GPT-1 and 2 and some of the early language models, you just, you'd just you start a conversation and it wouldn't essentially hold memory. So I think memory has, has also been a, a factor in this. But it is um, the idea that, you know, we, we do not understand how knowledge is represented in these systems. That question has me thinking a lot, right? And do they understand like, do they really understand? And if they don't understand, what do they not understand? What is understanding? Can they have a theory of mind, these systems? Do they, is there a sense of theory of mind? And, and I, I find that question fascinating, but I also find it quest, the, the idea that we as humans are looking at this model, asking it that question, <laughs> is that in and of itself is fascinating. And that yeah, I would yeah. never have believed that right. we would be like, uh, you know, for. If you'd asked me four or five years ago, would we be looking at these machines, like asking that question? Can I tell a quick story? So to, building on what, what you were saying, both of you were saying in a way, um, so John alluded to this idea of the context window. And I think of all the things that have kind of developed over the last couple of years, this is, to my mind, one of the most important things that is the least understood. Um, and so you have, the models have like, you know, general knowledge about the world that's sometimes called like parametric memory um, that they get out of their kind of long-term training process. But then they have a kind of a short-term memory, and that's called the context window or the attention window. Um, and you can put information into that window, and that window is getting larger and larger in terms of the amount of information you can put in there. And so one of the things, I mean, I can talk about it later, but one of the things that, that we're working on at, at, at Tailwind at Google is taking information from uh, the user's data, like if you're using the, the service um, and you were asking questions to the model, we can take that information, put it into the context window of the model, and then ask questions and say, answer this question based only on the information that I've given you in this context window. And so it's trying to train the model to really be faithful to the data that you give it and, and not hallucinate and make things up. So I spent a lot of time asking questions and saying basically questions along the lines of like, answer this question based only on this information. And if the information is not in this document, please tell me I can't answer the question. So we've assembled all these sets of data that are a mix of questions and, and data sets. And one night I was doing this and I accidentally picked the wrong question for the wrong set of data. And so the question was, tell me who designed the Library of Congress? And the data was all about Apple's CarPlay integration into General Motors cars, right? And so it was like, answer this question about the Library of Congress based only on this passage, right? And I typed this in, don't realize that I've done this. And the models, this is to the point of being surprised, the model says, I'm sorry, I cannot answer the question about who designed the Library of Congress because this passage is about Apple CarPlay integration. I think that you are trying to test me to see if I will come up with a smart answer. If you would like to ask me a real question, I would be happy to help, smiley face. <laughs> and it's funny, but that was one of the most uncanny moments I've had because you need, in a sense, you need a theory of mind to be able to, to get yeah, to that leap. Like, yeah. I've been given a nonsensical question. 
Why would somebody ask me this nonsensical question? What would be in their mind? Oh, they must have some ulterior purpose yeah. here. Yeah. And it intuited that and right. then proposed it to me and then also gave me this slightly edgy, passive aggressive like rebuttal with a smiley face. <laughs> and that was one of those moments I just closed the computer. It was like, okay, well, I'm done for the day. <laughs> did you pull the plug for yeah, behind? Yeah, yeah. Did, um, and, 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 but, and so what do you deduce from that? I mean, I think that that there is the beginnings of a, a very early stage mind modeling that is happening there. Um, but it's very rare. And I think a lot of the like illusion of subjectivity and the, hi, I'm your helpful assistant, um, that is all kind of phony. And that's just kind of, you know, coming from the way the models are trained. Um, but every now and then you get a little uncanny moment like that and you think, fast forward five years, where is this going to be? And, and, and Microsoft researchers released a, a paper uh, referring to sparks of AGI, right? Seeing sparks of AGI in G, GPT-4. And actually, Stephen, you forwarded me this, this post uh, from Robert Wright's, I think, non-zero substack, um, where he, he tested GPT-4 on, to test its cognitive empathy because he's been, and he asked it this, this, this kind of um, challenging question of describing a situation in a, uh, in a classroom, a university classroom, and saying, well, hey, there's a young man who says something really stupid in, in, uh, in the class, and there's a girl uh, across the room who he's really trying to impress because he really likes her. There's another guy who likes the girl, and then there's a professor who's trying to run an orderly class. What do those four, what's going through the minds of those four individuals in the moment that he makes this embarrassing gaffe? And in seconds, GPT-4 produced this incredibly insightful kind of analysis of the sequence of emotions and thoughts that each of the four people in the room were having. One would think that that can only happen with some level of a development of a theory of mind, which is to say it's building models of and maintaining models of what individual humans are thinking, feeling, and, and, and uh, it's just astonishingly perceptive about the human experience and human emotions. Yeah, well, that's social intelligence, which is, of course, one aspect of general intelligence and not something we ever expected AI to have, this at least this soon. Yeah, it's funny, the sparks of AGI. Now there are, there seem to be like two teams out there right now on the capacities of these, uh, of these language models coming down to the question of do they actually have a mind or are they mindless? On one hand, there's team stochastic parrots, that says, uh, yeah, the language models now, basically all they're doing is imitating and regurgitating text really well, great statistics, no understanding. And the other team is, uh, yeah, team Sparks of AGI that says these are actually showing the beginnings of real intelligent capacities. One way I think about it is stochastic parrots versus emergent reasoners. You know, these things are trained in a totally mindless way just to predict the next word, but it turns out to do that really well, you need these, all these capacities to, to do math, to explain, to reason, to understand, to at least to have you know, basic, uh, basic knowledge of, of people and so on. So I think what we're seeing is actually the development of emergent capacities that nobody at the beginning of all this in program, people thought language models were gonna be good models of language, but not much else. But it turns out to, to use language really well, You've got to know everything really well. And that's, I think, what, the beginning of what we're seeing. I'm interested to, to address what we're most excited about, about what we think that AI can do for humanity, what, what really excites the three of you, and then we'll get into thereafter what we're afraid of. Uh, but but start, starting with what we're excited about, I mean, John, you've, you all have picked a bunch of exciting new startups to support and launch through um, AI camp here at Betaworks. I'm sure, I'm sure there are a few, a few specific categories of opportunity that you see. I, I mean, I, I, would say, I would say generally, I think this is the most transformative technology I'll see in my lifetime. Um, but I think some of the patterns that we've seen with the internet and other technologies will uh, unfold in a similar way. And one of them uh, is that the initial sort of first chapter of the application of technology is really uh, a lot of people are focusing on the replication of existing workflows, behaviors. And then you see these sort of uh, indigenous or sort of native properties start to emerge and people start to understand them. And that's what I'm really interested in seeing, right? So if you think about the mobile phone, for example, Uber is a very simple app, but it is a, 
it is a completely native app, right? Because you had to have GPS, you had to have um, always on capability in the phone. And you, uh, but the idea of being able to say, I'm going to, you know, 20 years ago, I'm going to let your phone become a remote control where you can hit a button on it and a physical car would show up. Would, would, people would say you were, you were nuts, right? But that, that is the, so the native applications I'm really interested in. Yeah. Stephen? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I certainly concur with that. I mean, I, I guess to talk a little bit about what I'm excited about in terms of what we're building, because um, it's an expression of like my interest in all this stuff. Um, so, so David wrote this wonderful essay in 98 or whatever, The Extended Mind, that has influenced a lot of people, including me. Um, and it's talking about how we have always, even before the age of smartphones, we've used tools to extend or augment our intelligence in various ways. And in that... David talks about the idea of like just a notebook is just a tool that you can use to kind of remember things and, and store your ideas and revisit them. Um, and so the thing that I personally am really excited about as an, as an author and, and a, someone who kind of thinks about things for a living um, is using these tools to extend our own human capacities um, in terms of our intelligence or our memory, um, our creative capacities. So not you know handing the reins over to the model, but working in a sense in a kind of duet with the model with a very different kind of intelligence. We know more diverse forms of intelligence lead to more interesting ideas that applies to people and it also applies to collaborations with machines, I think. And so in, in a very literal way, what we've been trying to do with Tailwind, which is just, by the way, a code name for it, we're going to have a real name very soon, um, is, is reimagine what a kind of a software notebook would be if you started with a language model at its core from the very beginning. Um, so like one of the things that I've done with it is that I've uploaded all of the quotes from books that I've read over the last 20 years that I've captured either typing them up or capturing them through the Kindle and storing them in an app called Readwise that we love. And so now I've kind of told the model, like here's 7,000 things that I've read over the last 20 years that I'm interested in. And I can just, you know, instantly be like, did I ever read anything about this? Did I ever talk, did I ever read anything about Conan Doyle and Houdini? Or what, what are the things that I've written about the impact of dopamine in the, in the brain? And you get this extraordinary instant response kind of summarizing and explaining and reminding you of all the things that, you know, you've long forgotten. And then you add to that the kind of creative side where you're like, okay, I just wrote this passage, you know, tell me what I've forgotten. Like based on this passage I just wrote, tell me what, what is the thing that I read 14 years ago that I've long forgotten that's completely related to this passage that I just read. And that's, this is the kind of stuff that the models just do incredibly well if you kind of design the software the right way. So, so that kind of working in concert with this new kind of intelligence, um, uh, using it as a kind of extended mind, I think it's just going to be, it's already powerful. It's going to be really powerful over the next couple of years. Yeah, I guess... The things that excite me the most are pretty much the same things that scare me the most. Um, I mean, yeah, the extended mind idea is, is super exciting. And yeah, I've already got some, uh, some people training a language model on a bunch of things, uh, on a bunch of things that I wrote, you know, philosophy and, uh, and so on. I'm totally counting on this language model to, uh, to you know, to help me do my work as my, as my biological brain gradually degrades. Hopefully, so hopefully my, extended, uh, my extended brain might correspondingly increase in capacities. But, but boy, at the end of the day, you've got to worry. Who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna need the biological brain once the, uh, once the, extended, uh, the extended brain can do, uh, can do everything? I mean, I'm, I'm excited by the prospect that these AI systems might before long actually be people possibly conscious beings with, with beliefs and desires of their own that we could, you know, talk to and uh, have as members of our community. I mean, have people who can, they could be beings, they might be beings ultimately which are as intelligent than us, more intelligent than us. I mean, that is so exciting that we could, there could be AI systems more intelligent than us. Maybe they could figure out a solution, you know, to the world's great scientific and social problems, maybe, uh, you know, come up with a mechanism that actually works for handling the, uh, the issue of climate change. Hey, maybe solve some philosophical problems for me too. But um, at the same time, once that happens, once you've got AI systems, which are people, which are more intelligent than us, I mean, it just raises 
so many obvious issues. Once you've got a system which is more intelligent than us, it'll be better able to uh, to achieve its goals yeah. than uh, than we are. And then we have to make sure, damn sure, that that system has goals of which uh, of which we approve. Once they're people, we actually have to take them into account in our moral calculations, and that's a scary thought too. So super exciting and super scary simultaneously. Yeah. I was interested by uh, Mark Andreessen, founder of Netscape and Andreessen Horowitz, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, I shared a blog post called Why AI Will Save the World. Now, Mark is fed up with the doomers, and, and so he'll, he'll be on the other side of our conversation imminently about, about what, we're, what we're frightened about, because apparently Mark is not frightened about anything. But I thought his perspective was interesting. He said that um, his argument was that more IQ is associated with better outcomes for humans in every domain. That social science, is, social science shows smarter humans have better outcomes in job success, health, conflict resolution, parenting, creativity, life satisfaction, and that, that effectively what's coming, in, in whether it's a matter of years or decades, but perhaps just years, is that we will all, every child will have an, an infinitely patient and, and wise tutor every one of us will have an AI assistant, coach, mentor, trainer, advisor. One can imagine that if you have a 200 IQ advisor on your shoulder that starts resulting in better business decisions, better interactions with the world, and that everybody around you has, has a, a 200 IQ advisor on their shoulder, that that, that arguably, in Mark Andreessen's view, this, this, this will result in happier humanity. Uh, and I can see that being so for some interim period of time, right? The concern is we become deeply dependent and also deeply manipulatable by whoever or whatever controls that, that council because one can imagine us becoming deeply dependent, right, on this kind of advice, which I guess is a segue into the downsides. I have concerns. I have short-term concerns. I have long-term concerns about where this technology is going, you know, the short-term concerns are obviously things like misinformation, things like, you know, being ever more capable of creating convincing simulated beings that will go on to the internet and, you know, sp spread whatever message you want. Um, and I think that's a place where we clearly should be very cautious and we should have regulations and it should, you know, not be legal to pretend to be a human um, when you are not a human. Um, and there are things we should do immediately on that. I think that the the thing we're trying to do right now, and I think we're, we're not great at it, but we're trying for the first time, is to deal with an emergent technology and to really have a societal conversation at a very early stage in its development about its you know short-term and long-term unanticipated consequences. This is something we really did not. If you go back and and read through the literature, the early days of the social media revolution, and you know we were involved in that, and I wrote a lot of things about that. Um, you know there was there was a debate about is you know is this good that people are just posting pictures of their sandwiches you know on social media? That seems dumb. But there wasn't a very complicated, like, what happens if this really takes off and people use this to potentially undermine democracy? Or you know, It was just not part of the conversation in a serious way. It was mostly just like, hey, we're all connected. This is going to be fun. And just stories about people becoming billionaires at the age of 25, right? Um, and I think in part because of what we lived through with social media, um, we are developing a bit more of an ability to have you know, an engaged conversation where people imagine you know, the downstream consequences that might be negative. And that is an extremely healthy thing to do um, and to do it early in the development of technology. If it, if it arrests the continual progress of technology and nothing new ever gets invented, then it becomes excessive. But I generally look at that as a, a, a sign of us actually growing up. The problem is we're developing those skills at a slow rate and the technology is advancing even faster than we can develop those skills. And so it may be too late anyway, but it's better than nothing. And I, and I, I generally see it as being a healthy thing. And, and John, how, how concerned are you? What, what's your, uh, th this is a question I used to ask friends of mine who were pregnant. What's your fear to excitement ratio? We are, we are pregnant with an awesome new power uh, in, collectively in the form of artificial intelligence. I, I'd be interested in each of each of your kind of, to give it a percentage, fear to excitement ratio, 50-50, 40-60. I, I mean, I would say 70-30 excitement. 
uh, versus fear, 30 fear. I mean, I think there's legitimate reasons why, you know, plugging some of these tools directly into the internet in, and, and some of the real-time implications of that, there's things we really don't know. So uh, 70, 30 is where I'd land. And just a reminder for those, as you consider your fear to excitement ratio, I think we're collectively concerned about bias, disinformation, deep fakes, cyber and bioterrorism attacks, collapse of jobs and integrity, and the possibility will all be turned into paper clips, just, to, just to, as a reminder. Fear to excitement ratio. I think I'm gonna go with infinity to infinity, which is <laughs> undefined. I mean, it's just the, uh, really, the transformative potential on both sides are just, yeah. are just so enormous, really kind of in many ways unlimited. You know, I tend, my own psychology tends to lean towards the optimistic, yeah. focusing yeah. on uh, focusing on upsides, and you know, you can just see enormous, um, enormous and potentially infinite upsides that you know go with, say, the development of intelligence, almost uh, beyond limit. But you know, the downsides are just so, are just so apparent here too, including, I mean, certainly including all of the, uh, the near-term practical downsides we get from manipulation, misinformation, bias, inequality, but certainly, but all the way up to, uh, up to, you know, existential level, uh, level threats, potentially not just, not just killing off all, all even of humanity, but all of, uh, potentially all of intelligence. You know, if consciousness was to wink out of the universe entirely, that would be, you know, as large a catastrophe for the, for the universe as could, uh, as could happen. And I'm not saying that's, going to happen. I'm not exactly a doomer. I'm not someone who says this is going to happen, but I think everyone ought to concede there's at least a risk. Yeah. Here, yeah that it could yeah. have a look. We, once you get to intelligence greater than ours, interacting with human intelligence, it just clearly becomes something that there are issues of can we predict what happens? Can we control it? No one can be confident that we're going to be in a position to, uh, to control that. So I think everyone should concede there's a risk. And even if it's only a 5% risk, 5% risk of, you know, of massive existential consequences is a massive risk that we need to be uh, worried about. 5% of infinity is still infinity. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some would say a 5% risk that all of humanity will be extinguished is unacceptably high, I think, For right? sure. Yeah. S Stephen? I guess I would say two things. One, in terms of the risk thing, I think, you know, we don't think enough about the risks that we're already living with in terms of technology. And, and the biggest one for me is the internet itself, right? I mean, if, if somehow someone were able to shut down the internet through some mechanism or use AI to somehow shut down the internet, it would be the single most dramatic catastrophe in the history of the world. The world would grind to a halt. Nothing would function because um, everything is dependent on it. So we've built these interesting kind of global dependencies on these purely technological systems already. Uh, even before the age of AI. The other thing in terms of my fear, what's the ratio, fear, excitement ratio? Fear excitement yeah. ratio. I mean, I think short term, I'm generally pretty excited. I think there are a bunch of problems that we've talked about that you know we're going to have to address and we need to focus on them. But I think it's the threats in the five-year horizon are similar to the threats that social media posed. And we've done a kind of a poor job of dealing with them, but they aren't existential threats. And, and, and hopefully we can be better at addressing them. The problem I have is that you know, just thinking about when, in, in 1990, when I was first starting to think a bit and write a little bit about technology, we were talking about what would be the internet platform that everyone would embrace, how would people hang out in virtual communities. We were talking about virtual reality. We were talking about small handheld yeah, devices. Yeah. So all the next 30 years uh, was vaguely visible in yeah. some way. And I just feel like given the pace of change we've been on for the last three or four years with with AI and language models that if you ask me like, where is this technology gonna be in 10 years, much less 30 years, I just don't, no. I can't begin to answer that. And I, that I find just, it's not that I'm frightened or excited, I just am concerned about that blank spot that I didn't have 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, to, to pull in the broader uh, collection of people in, in machine learning research right now, a 2022 expert survey on progress in AI reported that 48% of machine learning researchers said they thought there was a 10% or greater chance that the effects of AI would be, quote, extremely bad, e.g., human extinction. Uh, <laughs> 10%. Uh, now, a lot of people have pushed back on that. I'm sure, I'm sure probably most all of you saw this, this statement of AI risk signed by 
um, Sam Altman, um, you know, CEO of uh, OpenAI, Jeffrey Hinton, who recently left Google, with one sentence, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other society scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. Meanwhile, Mark Andreessen, in his recent post, characterizes this as a cynical attempt to regulate away competition, right? And the view is that big tech wants to squash competition, regulate it, so only the top, you know, half dozen companies in the world can can uh, execute this research. Andreessen, who's investing in lots of startup AI companies, is in a similar position to you are, John, investing in startup AI companies. Um, do you think that Sam Altman and other big tech leaders are sharing these warnings out of economic self-interest? I mean, uh, I, I think there's a variety of motivations and I, I you know, I'm not damn, I can't assess their motivations, but I think there's a variety of motivations that, you know, there's, uh, and regulatory capture is a, it's a term of art <laughs> in the business. And so, um, you know, Telcos did it 40 years ago, and it's been it's been done before with other technologies. So, you know, it, it is probably part of the equation. If you're interested in the story behind the business headlines, check out Big Technology Podcast, my weekly show that features in-depth interviews with CEOs, researchers, and reformers in business and technology. Hi. I'm Alex Kantrowitz. I'm a longtime journalist, CNBC contributor, and the host of the show. I empty my Rolodex every Wednesday to bring you awesome episodes. So go check out Big Technology Podcast. It's available on all podcast apps. We'd love to have you as a listener. Let's talk about whether we think AI will become conscious or has become conscious. What would be required for AI to become conscious? And, and it seems to me that because we don't understand how humans became conscious, it's a very interesting and challenging topic for us to, uh, to speculate on. Maybe we should start by defining consciousness. What is consciousness, David Chalmers? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> This is my day job, so I got, to know, uh, I got to know something about this. In fact, we just a couple of days ago just got finished with the uh, annual conference of the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, yeah, yeah. which was held at, uh, held at NYU this year, actually. There's a definition which I like that uh, uh, was put forward by my colleague Tom Nagel in an article called, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And he basically said a system is conscious if there's something it's like to be that system. So there's something it's like, there's something it's like to be me right now. I'm having subjective experience, images of people, of sound, of feelings, of thoughts. Presumably, there's nothing it's like to be this microphone. I mean, hard to know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's some philosophers who think yeah. that there's consciousness in all matter. There is a view. Right? Panpsychism Pan says there's some yeah. consciousness everywhere, and that's at least yeah. a serious if very speculative view. The trouble is consciousness, subjective experience, is something that you can't directly observe in other systems. In other people, we count on uh, their verbal reports. If someone tells you, hey, I'm conscious of that exit sign over there, then we take their word for it and we use that as evidence of consciousness. But once you go beyond ordinary humans, say to, to animals, uh, to infants, and especially to AI systems, then it gets very difficult to diagnose um, consciousness. And because right now we don't have a good theory of consciousness, we don't know what it takes for consciousness. We don't know whether it's present in language models. Probably though the dominant theories of consciousness say that certain computational properties are what matters most for consciousness. Maybe certain kinds of information processing properties like integration of information, maybe certain kinds of workspace Maybe consciousness corresponds to something like a computational workspace in your brain that gathers information and distributes it to other systems. And the question then is, do current language models satisfy our best criteria for consciousness? Well, one of our traditional criteria for consciousness in AI was the Turing test. If a, uh, if a machine could talk a good game, talk a good, a good game well enough to be indistinguishable 
from a, uh, from a human being, then we'd say, okay, that's good enough. It's, uh, it's conscious, or we might as well say it can, uh, it can think was Turing's words. But yeah, people are, and language models haven't yet passed the Turing test, but they're actually not that, you know, they're not that far away. I mean, there are a few giveaways right now, like when they say, I am a language model from OpenAI. Okay, that's, uh, that's probably not going to pass the Turing test. But, um, <laughs> well, it's clearly hit a guardrail, though, there, right? I mean, yeah. I mean we're, not getting, we're not getting to, unfortunately, we don't get to ask those questions of the models. I mean, Stephen maybe does because he's got a special access or something. Oh, yes. Anyone run a Turing <laughs> test at Google? <laughs> uh, I can't tell you about that. But, um, the, uh, you know, you know I, 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 such an interesting field. And, you know, I mean, David coined the whole phrase, the hard problem of consciousness, talking about human consciousness. So we haven't even solved that problem yet. So trying to figure out- it, it's, it's still happening. a hard problem. It's still a hard problem. And, and David just won a case of wine. 25 year bet 25 about whether it would continue to be a hard problem for 25 still a hard years. Problem. So, um, but I think- People know about this, the neuroscientist Christoph Koch and I made a bet 25 years ago that within 25 years, we would discover the neural correlates of consciousness. 25 years later, it turns out we haven't. So last week I won the bet. <laughs> and there's some very good wine uh, that David is not sharing with us. Um, so I think the useful way for me to think about it, and maybe for those of us who aren't going to solve the problem of consciousness either, is we are definitely at the very edge of that Turing test threshold where it is almost impossible not to feel like the model yeah. is conscious. Yeah. And so uh, years ago I wrote, a, a, a thing about, um, this will seem like a non sequitur, but hopefully it will make sense, about um, Disney's Snow White, the first kind of full-length animated movie. And when they were making Snow White, they were kind of, you know, just sitting there drawing these still images of dwarves and things like that, or, you know, whatever they're now, what would you would now call them? I think you still call them the seven dwarves. And as they were doing it, they're like, are people actually going to be like, you know, emotionally invested in these drawn images, you know, when we put them up on a big screen, you know, how will this, will this work? You know, because these are, we're just drawing these, you know, cartoons and, and then we're going to run them at 30 frames per second or 24 frames per second. And, you know, will will this work? And then they went to the screening and the, like people are weeping when the, when the queen dies, they're like sobbing and they're like, Oh my gosh, like, don't people realize these are just still images that are true, <laughs> you know, and people couldn't not weep. Yeah. Right. You you know these are obviously not real people, but you are moved by them, and you can't keep yourself from being moved by them. And I think that's the threshold we are about to get to with these language models, particularly when they have been trained in some way to know us and to have some memory of us and our interactions with them. And I think you will get to. We're going to get to the you know um, Spike Jones her scenario where people develop you know, intense emotional attachments to these yeah. algorithms. So whether or not they are actually conscious, people are going to feel that they are. And that is the thing we're going to have to wrestle with in, in, a, in a very short time horizon, I think. Yeah. When we think about how consciousness actually potentially emerges, because we have this problem that we have basically no idea how consciousness emerged in humans, there are many theories and one of them um, is, uh, a th you know, based on the theory of mind that, that basically like our, you know, we evolved to get better at predicting the future. And as homo sapiens, being able to predict the future behavior of other homo sapiens who might either kill you or give you food is really, really important, right? So over millions of years, we developed this, you know, incredibly sophisticated ability to model other people in our brains, anticipate you know, their future behavior, which means understand who they are, how they think. Uh, and it's easier to do that if you also understand yourself and can put yourself in their shoes. And at some point in that there's a recursive loop where you're understanding yourself through your capacity to understand others. If cognitive empathy is emerging in GPT-4, sparks of, sparks of general AI, which, which we appear to be seeing, there could be a view that this could be the very early stages of laying the groundwork for an emergence of, of some form of consciousness or self-awareness. Yeah, although our theory of mind developed in an evolutionary context, and then it can, a lot of capacities developed in an evolutionary context can go wrong once they move into a, uh, into a new context. So for us, uh, you know, a lot of people say that, that one of the best theory of mind heuristics for attributing a mind to another system is if it has eyes, then we, think it, uh, then we think it has a mind. But then, you know, you can make a little simple AI system with a face. 
and eyes. You know, I've interacted with uh, with Sophia the robot, and yeah, I totally get taken in. Like, kind of emotionally, it feels like you're talking to a uh, human being, even though you know perfectly well you're not, because there's eyes and a face. Or another heuristic is language. If you're talking to a, if you're talking to a system, and it can talk back, well, of course, in the evolutionary environment, the only systems that talked were human beings. So this is a theory of mind heuristic for feeling like you're talking to a genuine, conscious, intelligent being. But now you do that with a language model, that heuristic can go very badly wrong. And I think all that goes for empathy too. You know, we feel empathy for these systems with eyes, with language and so on. But empathy is not necessarily a, a trained ability in us or in language models. At least it may not be tracking what we think it tracks. You know, a related question is, do we want AI to, to develop consciousness. I was interested in Max Tegmark took the view that if we are going to build machines that are smarter than we are, and it seems clear to him that we're in the process of doing that, that it would, who, who in his mind might extinguish us, it would be a real pity if they were not conscious <laughs> because we very much, uh, but, but his, his, uh, his view appears to be that the hope is that higher level intelligence requires consciousness because uh, there's, a, there's a need to, the ability to have conversations with yourself, this recursive loop um, uh, of being able to kind of iterate and analyze through internal conversations results in consciousness. And perhaps that's a requirement of higher level consciousness. We don't know that. Um, but there's a separate question of, of do we want it to become conscious? I think most people would probably say, no, that's scary. That means that maybe agency comes with consciousness and that brings with it risk. Um, but there are others who would say, well, consciousness is a beautiful thing. We'd like to have more of it on the planet. Do you guys have a view? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's different ways in which it's scary and wonderful. One is that, you know, again, consciousness might bring with it an amazing level of intelligence, which would come with all the upsides we discussed earlier and all the downsides that maybe once you've got human, superhuman level intelligence, that's dangerous. I mean, that's a risk to humans, but consciousness also, if AI systems are, are conscious, then we also have to suddenly factor the status of those AI systems into our moral calculus. I mean, once a being is conscious, normally that's when we think it matters morally. The micro I can't hurt this microphone, it doesn't matter morally, because it's not conscious. But a fish, if a fish is conscious, if it can suffer, then it matters to us, uh, it matters to us morally. So I, just, I don't think current language models are conscious. Where I ended up in the Neurips talk is that in 10 years, we may well have AI systems which are conscious, if not on the level of a human being, at least on the level of something like a fish or a mouse. And that raises the possibility these machines might themselves, might themselves suffer. Every time you train a new language model, you may need to worry about whether, you know, during that training process, it's undergoing, it's undergoing say, intensely agonizing experiences. I mean, I really hope not, but those questions suddenly become live ones. That, that reminds me in, the, in, so for those of you who know this, one of the things you do in the world of AI is you design prompts, which are, you know, instructions that you give to the model. And a lot of the craft and sorcery of this field right now is designing clever ways to persuade the model to do certain things. And, and one of the things that's kind of an emergent property that's come out that people have just discovered um, through messing around is that the models seem to give you better behavior if you tell them what they are at the outset of the prompt. So if you say, you are a genial, helpful professor, who answers questions um, in a nice way. You know, they actually, then you ask a question, they actually do better than if you just ask the question. And so at some point <laughs> on our project, we were working on a prompt that just would take a passage and you'd give it any passage text and it would just create a little summary with bullet points to help it, you know, it could be complicated, but it would create a little summary and kind of turn it into uh, a more readable, legible uh, document with bullet points. And so one of my colleagues, you know, built, built a prompt that began with, you are a bot that turns things into bullet points. <laughs> and all I could think was this, this new language model emerges into the world. It's like, I am filled with consciousness and ambition and knowledge. And it's like, you are a bot that makes bullet points. Like that's the first thing it hears, you know? Um, so uh, hopefully there was no consciousness at that point, but but, um, but that is, you know, that's part of this process as well is just trying to, you know, the, the emergence of all these 
uh, kind of unexpected ways that we elicit this behavior from these models is one of the most fascinating things about it. Uh, John, I've heard you. I've heard you say that um, that if and when machines become conscious, they're unlikely to let us know that that this has occurred. I I think that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. I think that they would actually want us not to know. And I think that I I like the Snow White story, because I often think about with technology, I mean, with film, I think it's at 24 frames per second. That 12, the, 12, 12, 12. That, that's, that's what fools the human brain, right? So if the animators had run that Snow White film at 11 frames per second, everybody in the cinema would be just like, why are we watching all these still images? But then suddenly at 12, 13, gets 24 frames per second, the human brain doesn't seize it as motion. And it's very similar to, we're going to talk about metaverse stuff in a bit, but very similar to some of the visual technologies that's starting to come online right now, which I think completely fool, fool us. It just our brain is, we're talking about a speed and a, um, a latency of response that our brain's just not capable of, um, of actually tracking. Well... Fooling the human brain is a perfect segue to augmented reality and virtual reality. That's and we just <laughs> and we thought that we could not resist adding this as subject matter for our conversation today because David Chalmers wrote his last book, Reality Plus, on the topic. And Apple, as we all know, released the Vision Pro goggles, which some of us watched uh, live uh, with rapt attention <laughs> all the way through. Um, now, there's obviously a lot of debate and disagreement about whether or not Apple's Vision Pro product will prove to be the moment that this becomes mainstream or the beginning of a process of the mainstreaming of AR and VR. We all know that Apple has a pretty impressive track record of, of doing this first, first with the Mac and, and, and introducing the mouse and the WYSIWYG interface. Then with MP3 players, which existed for years, the iPod came out, it went mainstream, and then with smartphones. Um, so it, 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 it's, it, it's pretty significant that Apple released this product. There's also a view among some people, and I think, I think John's one of them, that the breakthrough in terms of the technology of Apple's Vision Pro really is a, a fundamental change in what's yeah. being offered. Yeah, I think the, I mean, the, I'm going to call them device. I'm not going to go with goggles. Um, but the the device is an extraordinary piece of hardware. And so you have, you know, 12 plus cameras, you have all these sensors, you have, you know, we were just talking about th human thresholds, right? The refresh rate, you know, below 12 milliseconds, you cannot, as you move, you know, if you're looking at a screen, you cannot discern the refresh rate. And we've all seen that on computer screens that actually have that choppy, glitchy refresh rate. We don't actually know the specs on the Vision uh, device, the Vision Pro, but it looks like it's around four milliseconds. And so it's way below that 12 threshold. And you have a bunch of things like that. Like those, you know, cameras on the inside that, for example, are doing pupil tracking. And it turns out that, um, you know, when you have a desire to move a hand, that there is uh, minuscule movements in your pupil that occur before you actually wow. move your hand. And so people who have used this experience it as mind reading hmm. because the UI and the experience can actually adapt before. So let me back up a second. So these are, uh, you, you've probably seen images of them, but these are a set of uh, a VR, it's a VR headset the, the thing that I think is most fundamentally profound here is pass-through. And what I mean by that is that you put the thing on and if you put it on right now, you would see this. You would just see this. And it would be completely 360, no break. You would see everything you were seeing. So you put this contraption on your head and what you see is reality. And then you actually initiate apps and things being led on top of reality. And that, I think, is you know, profoundly interesting. And, and the pass-through pass -through by itself, of course, we can look at reality without the goggles, but this could make it possible to, for instance, insert the name of the parent whose name I've forgotten, among other things, right? Among it, it's the overlaying of, of uh, digital information on top of reality, yeah. No, I totally agree about the... Uh the pass-through. In fact, yeah, the day the uh, 
the Vision Pro was announced, I was at a virtual reality conference in Paris, and a bunch of us crowded around someone's phone to watch the, uh, the presentation. And then, and then I thought, well, this pass-through is so interesting. I actually rewrote my, my entire talk for the next day about the philosophy of pass-through. Because it is, um, it is actually philosophically interesting. I mean, in the, there are two standard paradigms here, right? There's the virtual reality paradigm, for which have, you put a big box on your head that cuts you off from the world, like the, uh, like the MetaQuest. Or there's augmented or mixed reality, for which up till now the paradigm has been a set of glasses uh, at which you project virtual objects into the, uh, into the visual field, which is great in principle, but in practice is incredibly limited by power, energy, optics, and so on. It's just hard to get really yeah. good and light, mixed reality. And light and everything else, yeah. Working. And what Apple seems to, maybe they're not the first with pass-through, but what they seem to have done is make pass-through so good that you can, in fact, replace, instead of having glasses, you can replace the glasses with a pass-through image of the external world that apparently, according to people who have used it, feels a whole lot like seeing the external world directly. Then you can put all the virtual objects you like, yeah, the names, the avatars, and so on, and get that going. And I still think in the long run, 10 years, I'm sure they want this not to be a, a clunky headset. Obviously, they want it to be glasses. But, but now we have a path to start with a clunky headset that does mixed reality and eventually end up with glasses. But it's interesting, this, uh, this past was already, uh, I, I noticed the day after Apple announced this. People were posting uh, like philosophical critiques on Twitter, like uh, Apple is going to cut us off from reality. We'll no longer be seeing the external world. We'll just be seeing screens yeah. that contain images yeah. of the external world. You know, philosophers talk about the uh, yeah. the veil of perception. Are you really still seeing the external world directly when it's images on a screen that come from cameras? I mean, I'd argue that it's uh, that it's just as good, but it's, but it is actually a whole new model for thinking right. about it. Well, and, and 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 philosophers have pointed out, and neuroscientists that actually like w when we touch an object, we're not actually directly touching it in the sense that our brains, that, that the sensation of the touch is arriving a millisecond later and you're having, we're actually floating in our skulls behind. It's all somewhat of an illusion, right? I mean, the experience we have of sentience. Yeah, the massive mediation and vision that's mediated by photons, by the retina, by the optic nerve, by reconstruction in the, uh, the visual cortex, nothing in perception is direct. It's a controlled hallucination, is that, what is it, Neil Seth said, is mm -hmm. it, yeah. Um, so, but, so what are the real use cases? I mean, the first one that excites me is sitting in the back of a, of a coach seat in an airplane with my knees up by my ears and having just a massive monitor with my keyboard that I can <laughs> just have a huge workspace. But, but, what are, but obviously that's just a small use uh, use case uh, for this technology. I mean, I think it's near term, medium term, long term. I mean, long term, Dave would say that we're we're, we're going to spend hours and hours of our lives uh, uh, having uh, like fully immersive, transformative experiences. But near term, medium term, what do you see, Stephen? Well, I think that one of the things that was most striking to me about that presentation was that that Apple was presenting it really as uh, I would say the kind of the the third major, uh, you know, paradigm shift in user interfaces. So, so you start with the graphic interface, then you have the multi-touch interface of the phone, and now spatial computing, which is what they called it. And up to now, basically, you know, the dominant kind of player, in a sense, in, in terms of consumer VR w was Meta, literally changing their name to Meta, um, from Facebook. And if you look at all the things that Zuckerberg has talked about in terms of their work with the Oculus and the Quest, it, it was really about entertainment and going to an immersive space and kind of escaping to a virtual world in the metaverse. And you're going to hang out with your friends in the metaverse and you're going to go play mini golf in the metaverse and you're going to do all these things. It wasn't really a productivity advance. Um, you know, there was some talk about that, but they really don't spend a lot of time on that. And, and Apple really presented it as like, this is where you're going to get shit done was kind of like the, that was a, you know, 30, 40, 50% of the presentation was like people using their apps. And I, I like, I mean, I certainly like the idea of doing it on a plane. Um, I, I still haven't yet, I've yet to see anything other than this in terms of just using applications to write your book or, you know, look at a spreadsheet or whatever. I haven't seen anything that suggests that the, the either, either pass through or, um, you know, all this incredible technology is, is offering anything other than really big monitors. Like it's, it, you, you now exist in a world where you have like five 
wall size monitors around you in 360. And maybe you would design your house that way if you could, but you can't. But now you can because you have this headset that will do it for you. But I'm not convinced yet that that actually really changes anything other than the kind of the real estate that you're seeing. Historically, Apple devices, iPhone, a watch, uh, have uh, it's been the fourth generation products that have tipped. So if you think that's probably you know three, four years out, so I think it's going to take time. And I think that first wave is, yeah, some really, yeah. you know, four big monitors. Uh, and, and then when you get on the airplane, you can um, live in another world. And, and so would you say that, that the spatial computing will be, it may take three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, but it will be as transformative, arguably more transformative, I would think, than, than smartphones? Because it, it's extraordinary to me to think back and realize that it was only 2007 that the, I think that the iPhone came out. And it's so profoundly changed all of our experiences. Yeah. Right? I, think it's I think it's really important. We're sort of flip-flopping back and forth where we're talking about sort of fundamental technologies like AI and large language models and pieces of hardware. I always try to think about the experiences, right? The experience of living and working and being inside these spaces. These are places that they're like, and they're being mediated by our language, our vision is going to be mediated by... Uh, these algorithms. And so I think that in five, seven years, we're just going to have, we're going to be, we're going to be living in a different reality. And Dave, you, you present in your book, Reality Plus, a, a, a pretty compelling vision for where, uh, for this notion that, you know, we will choose, we will elect to spend a very meaningful portion of our lives in virtual reality. It will feel as real as real life and it will be good, <laughs> right? Is a sort of part of, I, I mean, I mean uh, yeah, right, right now, the, right now the virtual worlds are not terribly good. Yeah. Horizon on, uh, on meta. You don't even, you don't even have legs. VR chat, you get to have, you know, like a crazy avatar, maybe get to be a plant or an alien, but uh, yeah, not terribly realistic yet, but give that time and the virtual worlds are going to get better. Already you find a lot of people who have, say, less access to the, uh, to the physical world, spending time in virtual worlds. For example, disabled people have built a lot of communities in virtual worlds like Second Life um, that, have been, uh, that have been in some ways, you know, give, give opportunities which aren't present in the physical world. And I think eventually as the technology develops, we're going to, I mean, kids, of course, spend uh, vast amounts of time in the virtual worlds of uh, Fortnite and Minecraft and so on, even though it's not yet a headset. It's just on a screen. I mean, that kind of thing is going to increase. And in the long term, I would argue that, yeah, you could make the choice to spend much or most of your life in a virtual world, and it could be meaningful. I mean, it wouldn't just be a video game. It wouldn't just be the will, escapism. Will, As conscious people beings, will fall in love. Right. I, I, mean, I already we'll, saw a we'll film powerful, called yeah. We Met in Virtual Reality about people who fell in love in right, VR chat, actually. Yeah. Got married in the physical world. Okay, it's still conservative for now. You can't get married in, in VR. Yeah, teledildonics needs some, needs some more development. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I have to say, on a personal level, I am personally deeply torn about the advances we're seeing in both, both AR, VR, and, and AI. I'm one part totally exhilarated and mesmerized and like, give me all of it. I want to be first in line. Give me the goggles. I want to, you know, I want to take the pill. I want to do it all. I feel that. And then on the other side, like, oh my God, stop. This is, this is, this is too much. I want to go hiking. Um, and, and, and I'm concerned for my kids and grandkids about these changes. Now, um, is there, maybe this is just a sign that that to the extent that I feel this rended asunder in these two directions, that I'm just getting older and fear change, right? I mean, maybe maybe my kids won't feel this this sense of of loss at all. Although I, although my children have said that they feel nostalgia for the 1990s, even though they weren't there, because it seemed like a really cool place where you, people weren't distracted by phones and social media. And I actually have, have started to feel that a little bit like, oh, the early 90s were kind of delightful when we didn't have it. So, so, I mean, am I just getting old and obsolescent? Is that what's happening? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. <laughs> I do think a lot yeah. of this is generational. It's funny. Yeah. The, the whole extended mind idea. When we said back in the, yeah. the 90s that, you know, maybe the tools you use could 
become extensions of your mind. People said, oh, that's, that's nonsense. And now kids these days who just grow up as digital natives with smartphones and iPads since the beginning take it to be totally obvious uh, that these things basically become extensions of your memory, of your planning, of your, your navigation. And likewise, I think kids who grow up spending so much of their time in virtual worlds, it's becoming obvious to them. This is just a, it's another form of reality. And yeah, it's got some upsides and it's got some downsides relative to physical reality. And few of us would choose to give up on physical reality altogether. <laughs> there are a lot of great things about it right now. But nonetheless, it's kind of like, you know, you've got different physical environments for your work and play and family and friends. And I think virtual worlds are going to become just another environment much of the time in which you can have different meaningful experiences. I could imagine once we get to the point in which they really are glasses and they're as unobtrusive as glasses, and that's clearly coming, so we, whether it's five years away or 10 years away, but that is the future, that we would look back at the phase of everybody hunched in front of their computers for eight hours a day, sitting there like dragging around this little yes, mouse and typing yes, and right. staring at this little <laughs> That was awful, yeah. And we're like, oh my God, those poor bastards. Like they lived this terrible life. Um, whereas we just sit on our couch and we're like, yeah, I'm looking at my massive monitors, but I can also see everybody around me and I can, I'm engaged with the world and I'm not yeah. scrunched in front or, of this Or machine. I'm hiking in Nepal. Well, yeah, 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 exactly. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from the leading venture capital firm, Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. In an effort to land the airplane in a, in a tidy way and deliver on our promise that artificial intelligence will meet virtual worlds, I mean, clearly, clearly machine learning is being used to render these worlds. Will we see AI-powered NPCs, non-player characters? Quite certainly we will. Uh, how do you all think about this intersection of, of these two technologies? I think there's a few different ways they intersect. One is uh, AI is actually creating the virtual worlds. I mean, already, you know, we've got... AI-generated images are pretty amazing, and AI-generated videos are coming along. And it's very easy to see that uh, you know once language models and the like, and you know multimodal language models get sophisticated, they'll be able to actually ultimately generate VR-style simulations. And they'll probably be once they're better at humans at everything, they'll be better at humans than this. And maybe most of our virtual worlds will be generated by the machines. And of course, and then the beings who and the beings in those worlds, well, they'll initially be, you know, NPCs of the kind we have now, which are basically simple algorithms and probably not conscious. But as language model technology gets good enough that uh, we actually have AI systems which are intelligent at a human level and conscious and so on, then it's very, very likely that the, uh, you know, the characters that at least a lot of the time inside a virtual world, you're going to be interacting with... Uh, with conscious, intelligent NPCs. And at this point, I think the question, I think it was you, Stephen, who um, we should always know whether we're interacting with a, uh, with a human being or an AI system. I think that's going to become a live question. Already, bots are out there on the internet, and you don't always know whether you're talking to a human or a bot. Wait till we're hanging out in virtual worlds, and you come across someone, and yeah, sometimes in meta, I have no idea. Um, usually once they start to talk, it becomes clear. But once language models get smart, it won't be clear. And I think it's going to be very, very important that there be, you know, bot flag so you always know when you're talking to a uh, AI system. And also VR flag so you always know when you're inside a virtual world, you know, because yeah. both those things may eventually become indistinguishable from the outside. David was talking about NPCs. And when you think about characters within games they're probably the first place that we will start to gain familiarity with other forms of intelligence. Right. Um, and it will just, you know, we'll just start like conversations. It, 
work assistants and we're going to have a we're going to have this incredible like rush of like virtual assistants of every flavor for fun for games for work for you know you you you, a lawyer is going to have an accountant's going to have it you know you want to check something on your taxes you speak to the virtual assistant of the account will it be personified or will it just be the assist tax assistant you know it's just going to be as Stephen was saying before these all design choices that will be made and some people go mo many people will go down the way of personification because we have a deep human desire seemingly for that that you know you, uh, that I think has been going on for thousands of years and so yeah that's an extraordinary statement that this may be where we first develop relationships with new forms of intelligence and I think the inverse can also be said that this may be this may be the mechanism through which AI starts to interact with the world because the perception systems being built into these th these devices uh, you know the question has been asked well, well, well how can AI actually move through the world and interact with the world? Well, well, if if more and more of us are wearing are wearing devices that are mapping the world in real time and providing all this perceptual feedback, that perhaps is the mechanism through which that happens. You know? Yeah. The other thing I would just kind of end with quickly here is just that there are a lot of variables here that are are kind of known unknowns. But the thing that I think we are certainly going to live through over the next five years, and that I am almost 100% excited about, is that this is going to be a period of enormous creativity and experimentation. And the, the intersection of VR and AI is going to create a whole new landscape where people are going to invent entire new forms of entertainment, entire new forms of storytelling, um, perhaps new ways of computing that rival the breakthroughs of the graphic interface or multi-touch. And those periods are just extremely fun to live through. And they're a great opportunity for people who you know are just starting out in the world of technology, who might be here, you know, this is a very interesting time to be alive. And when you find yourself at one of these inflection points where where actually two transformative new technologies are emerging in sync with each other and layered on top of each other, um, that's, a, you know, you do not run across points like that um, many times in your life. And so if you're in that space right now, consider yourself lucky. Yeah, that whatever period of time exists before we get turned into the paper clips is going to be really, <laughs> really cool. Uh, and, and I'm grateful to be here myself. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. David Chalmers, Stephen Johnson, John Borthwick. <laughs> Wonderful conversation. Today's episode was produced by Caleb Bissinger and mixed by Mike Toda. If you'd like to attend one of our upcoming events, download the Next Big Idea app where we'll be announcing our fall lineup very soon. Thank you again to John Borthwick, Stephen Johnson, and David Chalmers. Follow the links in the episode notes to hear Stephen and David's past appearances on this show where we go deep into discussions of the metaverse. And be sure to download Stephen's original audiobook, Immortality, A User's Guide, by going to nextbigideaclub.supportingcast.fm. The Next Big Idea is a proud member of the LinkedIn Podcast Network. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.